Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm going to take today's video to review a argument that's put forward by Randall Carlson. Other people have put forward this argument as well. I'll also be doing a brief video review of a similar argument that's put forward by Graham Hancock. This argument is an argument for a lost civilization. This argument that the claim that's being made here is that human history as we know it, or the record of human history that's being presented to us is fundamentally incorrect. And that there are large swaths of human history that for whatever reason, Carlson will say that there are these kind of catechismic geological events which happen, which have erased it, but that have been lost to us. But the claim is that although these civilizations are now gone, that there is some forms of knowledge that survived, whether in the form of mathematics or religious ideas, architectural achievements. It's kind of unclear what we're talking about in that regard but that there was something that survived from these civilizations that was given to and imparted on civilization as we know it. Now, I'm presenting this as a part of my series on conspiracy theories, and as it stands, this is not a conspiracy theory in the strict meaning of the word, but rather this would fall under the general umbrella of what we would call pseudo-history or pseudo-archaeology, and the reason for this is that the narrative that Carlson is going to present is fundamentally at odds with the commonly accepted narrative that will be presented to you in a, in a basic history textbook or archaeology textbook. So that's where the rub is. It could be conspiratorial in nature in the sense that sometimes people who support this argument will say that this narrative is being suppressed or that it is actively being shut down by historians and archeologists. And if that's the claim, then it would be a conspiracy theory, but more so uh, pseudo history. I'm gonna take this video to review uh, very briefly. This will be kind of a high level review. And the questions I'm gonna raise here are more so methodological questions. I'm not really gonna take issue with most of the facts that are listed, but I'll provide some resources in the description of this video that will talk about how and why, not why, but we'll talk about how Carlson misinterprets uh, some aspects of history. This video is going to be structured a little bit differently in that I'm going to be showing you uh, a, a clip from Carlson using his own words. This is from a YouTube channel called After School, which I will also link in the description of this video. Before I get into the video, I wanted to address, this is something that I talked about in my logic of conspiracy video. I want you to think about what's referred to as standard of evidence or the standard of evidence. Anytime you're engaging with an interlocutor or anytime you're having an argument or a disagreement with somebody, the standard of evidence might be different from both parties. There's a certain level of acceptable evidence that it would take in order to convince you that that person is correct or that what they're saying is somehow believable. As I talked about in the logic of conspiracy video, this standard of evidence is slightly different depending upon the discipline that we're talking about and depending upon the context that we're talking about. So for example, scientific evidence is inherently different from historical evidence for obvious reasons, right? For example, history doesn't use mathematical proofs to support historical ideas for the most part, unless you're dealing with like a dating system or something like that. But if I wanted to convince you, if we're having a discussion about the role that, let's say, the extent to which Germany started the First World War, that Germany was responsible for starting the First World War, uh, an algebraic proof is not going to really do anything to help my argument in that regard, because history appeals to a different sort of evidence. So what I want you to think about as Carlson is talking, start off with a little bit of a thought experiment. Suppose, for example, you had never heard of ancient Egypt. It's just like wiped from your memory. And somebody was trying to convince you that ancient Egypt existed. What could they present to you in order to convince you 
that there was this civilization that we call the Egyptians. What would it take in order for you to believe that? Now, there's all sorts of different things that we could draw from, right? That person could show you, for example, um, ancient Egyptian uh, pottery, baskets, clothing. They could present you with the physical stuffs that ancient Egyptians produce war and used ancient Egyptian tools and stuff like that and say, see, this is what ancient Egyptian people used on a daily basis. They could show you the ancient Egyptian writing system, hieroglyphics. They could say, this is how ancient Egyptians recorded their history, their business transactions, their mythologies. They could even teach you how to read it. They could point you to the ancient Egyptian pantheon the system of religious beliefs that Egypt had. They could explain different Egyptian gods and goddesses. They could show you ancient Egyptian architecture, things like the pyramids of Giza or step pyramids or tombs of Egyptian pharaohs. And all of this kind of taken together would start to hopefully form a picture for you of what ancient Egyptian civilization was like and would hopefully be convincing, convince you that the ancient Egyptian civilization existed and that this is how we explain all of these artifacts and all of these pieces of evidence. So what sort of evidence would it take in order for you to believe that a lost civilization existed? Again, the primary claim here is that prior to, well, I'll say this, let me just start the video and we'll get into it. But what sort of evidence would it take in order to convince you that this lost, previously unknown civilization existed? There has been some kind of a universal system at use in the ancient world. And these various cultural groups, whether it was the Egyptians or Sumerians or Mayans or the Hopewellians or the megalithic builders, had access to some universal system from some source that was outside their own cultural context. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack here. The central claim being made here is that these dispersions these diverse ancient civilizations. So when we're talking about ancient civ, we're usually talking about river-based civilizations and river-based civilizations appeared across the globe roughly 12,000 years ago, 10,000 BC, in sites like along the uh, Nile River in North Africa, Egypt, Tigris and Euphrates River, modern day Iraq, um, the Indus River in northern India, the Yellow River in China, and in Mesoamerica. Um, there's lots of different rivers, not just one, but Mesoamerican civilizations. The claim being made here is it's difficult because on some level, some of these civilizations had contact with each other. Well, let me get into the claim first. So the claim being made here is that there is a common foundation of knowledge that all of these different civilizations are drawing from. That there is something that's being tapped into, so to speak, by these different civilizations. Now, on the one hand, that's not that uh, absurd of a claim. Because Although these different civilizations are separate and distinct from each other, we know through the archaeological record that some of these civilizations had contact with each other. And by contact, I mean they traded with each other, they intermingled with each other, and they swapped with, with physical trade, with the trade of goods, also comes the, the trade of ideas, right? So, for example... Um, ancient Egyptian civilization had a tremendous cultural impact on places like ancient Greece. The ancient Greeks uh, adopted aspects of Egyptian culture and things like Egyptian religion influenced ancient Greek religion. Um, the same could be said of civilizations as far as part as uh, the Roman Empire and China, right? We know through archaeological evidence 
that Rome traded with China, not only did they trade, but that, for example, people from Chinese civilizations made their way over to the Roman Empire. And there's an interchange in that regard. But what's being claimed here is a step further, which says that civilizations as distinct as Mesoamerican civilizations or North American civilizations had the same, uh, are drawing from the same traditions as that of ancient Egypt or ancient India and ancient China. And no historian or archaeologist would accept that ancient Egypt had any contact whatsoever with, let's say, the Olmecs or the Mayans, or that Rome had contact with the Hopewellian civilization of North America. For the most part, the civilizations which existed in the Americas existed in isolation from the rest of the world until the 15th century, as far as the established historical record goes. But Carlson's saying, not necessarily that they had contact with each other, but there was some previous civilization that they are all drawing from that connects global civilization as a whole. And I suggest that the source of that goes back into deep time that takes us back beyond the threshold of known history into the realm of mythical history, which means we're going back like into the Ice Age, back into the Pleistocene, to use the geolog geologist term, back into the, to the deep recesses of the human tenure on planet Earth, uh, whose only memory has come down to us, not in the form of recorded history, but in the form of myth and epic story and legend and so forth. Because as it turns out, if we, and this, this is again is a, is a good topic for the sacred geometry class. Okay, before he continues. So again, the idea is that there's this common cultural knowledge that is being passed from this lost civilization to other human civilizations that we know of. Now, the standard account, to be very brief, is that civilization as we know it first started to appear around 10,000 BC in an event that's generally referred to as the Neolithic Revolution, sometimes called the Agricultural Revolution, and that this occurred globally roughly the same time, give or take a few thousand years, depending upon where we're talking about. Unites all of these places is the uh, domestication of various plants and animals. And what this allowed is for prior to the Neolithic revolution, I have a video on human early human migration that covers the Neolithic revolution, if you want to reference that. But prior to this event, most people, most humans, well, not most, all humans on earth were nomadic, traveling around in various size family groups moving from one place to the other. After the Neolithic revolution, we see a kind of settling down because the development of agriculture allows for higher population levels. Higher population levels requires a more sophisticated system of organization. So you have the development kind of as a direct result of increased population. Agriculture leads to increased population. Increased population leads to early forms of government. Early forms of government leads to the uh, systematic systemization, organization of religious structure. All of this kind of creates a domino effect that leads to civilization. And civilization just means, basically just means urban living, people living together in large groups that extend beyond family groups. And that's the commonly accepted historical timeline. And then from there, we get the distinct civilizations. What Carlson's saying here is that what connects them is not necessarily the development of agriculture, but this knowledge that's being passed along and that the reason why we know they're connected is because of their mythologies. Now, unfortunately, he doesn't go into a whole lot of detail about what he means by that, but what he's suggesting is that the religious traditions of all of these civilizations, I guess, 
are similar enough to suggest that they come from the same source. My rebuttal to that would be that that is a gross simplification of ancient religion. Spend some time studying Egyptian religion, and Chinese religion, and Olmec or Mayan religion. Are there similarities? Yes, in some of these cases, right? So it's it's not that in there's some clear examples of this in ancient history. Look at the Hebrew Bible. Compare and contrast the story of Noah to the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? The, the flood narrative in the Epic of Gilgamesh, instead of Noah, you have up to Pishtim. Um, but the, the stories are very similar, which suggests there's cultural overlap. This idea of intellectual influence is further supported by the idea that the ancient Israelites spent time in Babylon and that the Babylonian culture was influenced, the Epic of Gilgamesh was a part of Babylonian culture. So it would make sense that, because they were captives, if they were captive by the Babylonians, that they would be exposed to Babylonian religion and be exposed to Babylonian stories, and that these would in turn influence their religion and their stories. And this is supported by the archeological, historical, and the religious evidence. But to suggest, for example, that the Epic of Gilgamesh is in any way similar to, I don't know, Maya religion. There, it's, where's the connection? How are they similar? In what way? Or maybe a little bit more plausible would be that the religion of ancient India. So after the Indus River Valley civilization, you have the... Uh, writing of the Upanishads, roughly 1500 BC in ancient India, you might suggest that there was some influence of Indian religion on, let's say, Greek religion. That would be a stretch, but you could point to the fact that historically speaking, the Greeks and the Indians had contact with each other. Alexander the Great extended Greek civilization. He fought against, I believe it was the, the Gupta Empire. They encountered each other, they traded with each other, they fought with each other, they probably exchanged ideas. So that would be a little bit more tangible. But to suggest just full slate that all of these mythologies are connected, uh, just do a detailed study into any of these mythologies. It's hard to see there are similarities in some, yes, but a more, a more detailed case would be made to connect, for example, the mythologies of the Americas with that of the Egyptians, let's say, but I'll, I'm rambling a little bit, so let's, let's go on. When we analyze Plato's description of Atlantis, Plato basically gave the, sink, the date of the sinking of Atlantis as 9,000 years prior to Solon, the, the Egyptian, the, the, the Athenian poet and statesman, Solon did a 10 year exile in Egypt. And it was Solon that brought back the tale of Atlantis and presented it to the, to the Greeks. And Solon basically made that journey around 600 BC. So if you add the 9,000 years to the 600 BC, we come up with a date of about 11,600 years ago for Plato's date for the, 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 the demise of Atlantis. Well, it's very interesting that the date 11,600 years has been independently discovered by geologists looking at the tempo of various catastrophes that have Okay, so this kind of speaks to what I was attempting to get at with the explanation of the various mythologies here. Part of what's happening is a stripping of the mythology of their cultural context and forcing it to fit in this other narrative, which is, if you reference my debunking ancient aliens, is in history a little bit of what we would call anachronism, interpreting a story outside of its cultural context. And we see that here with Plato. 
and the interpretation of Plato's story of Atlantis. Now, there's been a lot that's been done to kind of debunk this idea of Atlantis as an actual civilization and that Plato's recalling the story of this civilization. I'll link some of those videos in this description that goes into more detail. Uh, but essentially what's happening that I see, misinterpretation, <laughs> obviously, a misinterpretation of Plato, but this misinterpretation results from reading Plato as history and not as philosophy, or in this case specifically, reading Plato's story of Atlantis as history and not as uh, allegory or as a story. This is the equivalent of, this would be the equivalent of you sitting down with your friend and watching, for example, uh, a Captain America movie, watching the first Captain America movie, um, and seeing the depiction of, of Hydra and the Red Skull as a Nazi, and your friend saying, oh wow, I didn't know uh, Hydra was a Nazi organization. I wonder if the Red Skull had any contact with Hitler. So he's, he's taking something which is obviously fictional, which is taking something like a comic book movie and interpreting it as relating to actual history. And the movie itself is not meant to depict history. It's meant to, to tell the story of Captain America, which is not to say that Captain America can't, as a story, can't provide commentary on history, which I think it's trying to do, but to say that it's not meant to be taken literally. When Plato, throughout his writing, a couple of examples of this, the story of Atlantis is meant to not convey a historical record, but is meant to prove a larger philosophical point, meant to demonstrate an idea or present an idea to the reader in order for the people in Plato's dialogue to engage with it. Um, a, a similar thing, it's an allegory, a similar thing might be to draw a comparison with like the story of the boy who cried wolf. The purpose of that story is not to tell you an actual historical event of a kid that was eaten by a wolf because he lied about it, but rather to teach the people who listen to it the dangers of being dishonest and the implications that could result from being dishonest, namely that people wouldn't believe you. Plato uses allegory, metaphor, even mythology throughout his writing in order to demonstrate larger philosophical ideas. He does this in Plato's, in his Republic and in the Timaeus, which is where the story of Atlantis comes from. But the purpose of Atlantis is to engage with this idea of what a good society looks like or what a good society would look like, and maybe a reference to historical events like the Trojan War or something along those lines. Maybe Plato is commentating on what would be his contemporary political events. But the idea is, and it's clearly in the dialogues itself, and I would encourage you to go read those, it's clearly presented as a story. It's not presented as history. So what we have here by Carlson is a, is a, taking it out of context, honing in on the story of Atlantis that's presented by Plato, ripping it out of the Timaeus and saying, we're going to treat this as history, which is not what Plato's intent was. Okay. Uh, Carlson will go on to kind of outline how he believes the ge geological record corresponds with the destruction of this lost civilization. Again, that's kind of out of the scope of my territory. So I'm going to scoot past this till the end. The energy pulses that would be affecting Earth are non-random, that they are on some kind of a cosmic timetable, a cosmic tempo, if you will. And I think this is one of the most important insights we get from these ancient traditions is the measurement of cosmic time and how it relates to us here on Earth. You just got to know what to look for and where to look for it. Once you begin to become aware of it and you begin to see it, you begin to realize that the cosmic fingerprints are everywhere about us. We're in fact living in and upon the wreckage of the former worlds. The rubble of these former worlds is all around us, but we haven't had the scale of perspective to see. It. And that's where we're at now.
I'm, I'm completely thrilled with things like the emergence of Google Earth because Google Earth is now allowing us to just somebody, all of us to sit at our computers and see the cosmic perspective of Earth. And when you look at it from, you know, from the, from the extraterrestrial point of view, things begin to show up that we don't see when we're right down here immersed on it so close that we're like ants walking on the rubble and can't. So the final suggestion I want to deal with here, he, Carlson says in that clip that these civilizations are built on the rubble of previous civilizations. And the final thing I want to point out here, and this again relates back to the video that I made on the logic of conspiracy theories. Part of the issue is what I would call, what I call in that video, uh, a very unclear standard of evidence. And part of that unclear standard of evidence is the offering of an explanation for things that already have an explanation. So Carlson is taking the architectural achievements of civilizations like Egypt and the Indus River Valley and the Aztecs and saying that the reason why they were able to accomplish these things is because they had access to this knowledge from previous civilizations. What I'm, and I was talking about this question with my students the other day, and one of the questions that was asked, okay, let me back up a little bit. So he's saying that these things could be explained or explicable because they're building off of these older civilizations. The issue with that, it's not that that idea is somehow like unbelievable or that that, that idea is like irrational. The problem is, is that we already have explanations for these things. And so what he's doing is providing an explanation for something that doesn't need an explanation and saying that because the explanation is reasonable that it somehow lends credence to the idea. That's not to say that an alternative explanation can't be provided. I was having a conversation with my students the other day about this very point, and one of my students, rightly so, asked the question, well, it seems like you're suggesting that uh, history can't change or that alternative theories can't be put forward. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that how a theory works in history is that a theory is put forward in, a, in order to explain the evidence that we have at our disposal. And historical theories work to provide narratives and rationales for this evidence. What's happening here is an alternative explanation is being put forward, but it's appealing to the evidence that we already have and that has already been established. The equivalent of this would be if I were to provide an alternative explanation for gravity, let's say, and then give you, and you ask me, well, what is this alternative theory of gravity based on? And I just give you Newton's laws of motion. You're appealing to the same evidence that I already have at my disposal right? You're not offering anything new. Part of the issue with, though not part of the issue, the main issue with Carlson's theory is that it's not putting forth any positive evidence. Going back to that thought experiment that I offered at the beginning of this video, what would it take in order for you to believe in ancient Egyptian civilization? And I gave you several different pieces of evidence that we could draw from. What evidence do we have of this lost civilization? The only evidence that's being pointed to is evidence for other civilizations. Where is the architecture of this lost civilization? Where is the pottery of this lost civilization? Where is the architectural remains of the cities that were produced by this lost civilization? Where is the means by which they transported this knowledge across the globe? Did they do it by ship? Did they do it by plane? Did they walk? Where is the evidence for this? Unfortunately, not much is being provided. All right, thank you all for joining me today. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. If you thought this was completely wrong and off base, feel free to post in the comments, and I'll see you all next time.